and we're back and we are here with the creator of Dark Side of the Ring, Mr. Evan Husney. Evan, how are you, my friend? I'm doing all right. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate uh, it. Thanks for coming on. I mean, we're super excited. Actually, Steph just watched uh, part one of Brian Pillman. Nice. Um, yeah. I hope you liked it. I hope you enjoyed it as much as you can. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I was definitely surprised to see it up there. I was kind of searching uh, just YouTube to see what was up there for Dark Side of the Ring and saw they had already posted that yesterday. I'm guessing That's it's right. just a teaser to try and get people into season three because doesn't that drops on Thursday, right? Right. Yeah. We yeah we, we uh, last year we did a little sneak peek uh, of our of our premiere episode for season two. It's kind of the same thing except for. This is just the first part. So on Thursday, you're going to get part one and two back to back. So, oh, they're... okay. They are both coming out on Thursday. Yep. It's a okay. full two hour show. Yeah. On Thursday. Yep. Oh, gotcha. got it. Okay. I thought I saw that it was Thursday and Saturday. So that is nope. good to know. Okay. That yeah. makes more sense then. So yeah. did, did you originally uh, plan for Pillman to be two parts or was there just so much? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because, uh, Pillman <laughs> as a story was something that we, uh, have considered a lot over the years working on this show. I know definitely in season two, we definitely tried to make it happen. Um, and was kind of like something we wanted to kind of hold out to be able to get Steve Austin to be a part of, cause we felt like, you know, like their careers are kind of, you know, we're so linked Brian's and Steve's coming up to the business. And I sort of felt like. You know, this is not necessarily a story about Steve, but it is kind of like a little of his origin story a little bit is is sort of wrapped up into this story about Brian. And um, it didn't quite come together for season two. It didn't quite come together. And then we kind of held it back. And then if there was ever a season three, we were going to do it for sure. Um, because uh, during the time, I think it's actually a couple of years back when we were working on it, I read a amazing biography about uh, Brian Pillman called Crazy Like a Fox by uh, Liam O'Rourke. It's a really great wrestling biography that came out a few years ago. And that just got way, I mean, I was familiar with Brian because I'm a fan, as you can see, but like, you know, I that really kind of got into really detailed into his personal life. And that was just like really eye opening, like, wow, this is going to be like a sweeping or this is a sweeping dramatic story. You know, it's not just the in ring side, which is fascinating. Um, and then when we started shooting it, uh, we didn't anticipate it was going to be a two hour episode, to be honest with you guys. And then as soon as we started shooting it and uh, the 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 interview subject count just kept getting higher and higher with more family members and more more other people, you know, being a part of the project that it was like, all right, there's just no way possible we can do this in one hour. So we had to actually like. Uh, in the middle of production, like go back and pitch the network, like we need to extend this. And so that's what we did. Yeah. So with that, you mentioned the interview subjects. Is it hard at times to get people to come in for this? Is there anyone that's kind of like hard no, not doing it, or it's a struggle to just get them? It depends who it is. I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, wrestlers are so used to being on camera, uh, you know, and if they have no conflicts, you know, the, uh, you know, in terms of telling the story or whatever, they're more than happy to participate. Others, it can be, um, you know, full family members in particular might be, you know, that th that's just more of a process in that, you know, family members aren't used to being on camera and, and telling these stories on, you know, on, on, on television or, they just, you know, are very sensitive to or how we're going to portray the story or who we are. And there's kind of an education process, you know, um, to where we just try to, you know, introduce ourselves, get them to know, you know, like, you know, sometimes I've flown out to meet family members without, you know, cameras and, um, you know, uh, just so we can create some sort of relationship before we take a journey and to make one of these episodes, which could be quite you know, emotionally difficult at times. Um, and then there's uh, other wrestlers that, you know, do say no and they don't want to be a part of it or they, they can't if they're, you know, um, sometimes under contract with WWE is not something that they're freely allowed to do interviews like this. So, um, yeah, it's, it just depends. You know, there's all different kinds of challenges. It's probably one of the more challenging aspects, actually, of making the show is getting all the right people on board to tell the story. So we noticed that you're doing um, Grizzly Smith's family, which is, you know, Jake Roberts, Robin, um, Rock and, Rock and Robin, uh, and Sam Houston. We spoke to Sean Oliver a couple months ago, and he told us that he once had Jake lined up to do an entire shoot interview. And basically Jake got there and found out 
what it was going to be and was like, hard no, I'm not doing that. And I feel like he's slowly kind of gotten better over the years. So did you find hmm. like anyone that you kind of thought from the beginning that they were going to be on board? And then once the camera started rolling or the cameras were there, they were like, no, we, we're not doing this. Um, well, uh, you know, there are certain stories that I don't think we could have t told, you know, or th there's the stories we couldn't have um, tried to tell, you know, in, in, in season one. Like if you go back to season one, like we just hadn't built like any credibility or any um, sort of trust, you know, in this world. I think slowly or like as the seasons have been unfolding, you know, people kind of see the way we approach these stories, uh, these more challenging, difficult, emotional stories, you know, where, where we are coming from a place of, you know, people are complex and, you know, there's empathy to have for, you know, these moments and non-judgmental. And obviously we're, we're fans of wrestling, so we're not trying to, you know, bury it, you know, while we're, while we're covering it. So I think that has helped us along the way to be able to tell those more difficult subjects, um, you know, in terms of building trust in this community, I guess, more or less. Um, and I think that, I think the, the Smith family episode, the one that we're doing this season, I don't think we probably would have been able to tell, like if we started out doing it in season one, just call, call up Jake and say, Hey, this is where we want to go with the story. I don't think he would have entertain that idea um but uh it was one i was fascinated in in, in trying to tell for the season and you know it, it, it kind of goes back to a movie from the late 90s called uh beyond the mat you know beyond the mat is a wrestling documentary that i remember seeing in the theaters and obviously a big influence on everything we do because it really was one of the first <clears throat> glimpses we got as fans of really seeing like you know raw you know wrestler emotions and stories uh in a big forum like that and so um that left a big impression on me because jake is in that and he does talk about his family talks about his father his father's in it and he talks about uh just you know some of the abuse and he talks about how his sister was kidnapped and all these other just wild wild stories and so we we kind of had the idea of like well we'd love to have jake back on the show because he's just absolutely magnetic on screen he's such a good interview he's he's, he's awesome and so what we did is we um, reached out to him and, and, and pitched this idea like, hey, what if we got you and your other siblings together and we told the story? And, you know, um, he had to think about it and he had to reach out to his siblings and they're not that close these days. Um, and I was grateful that he did that for us. And uh, everybody was on everybody was on on the up and up to do it. Um, but basically, you know, we had to, to tell a story as difficult as that, you know, and for those who don't know, you know, uh, <clears throat> Jake and his siblings come from a very, you know, they have, there's a lot of stories that have been out there in recent years about abuse suffered at the hands of their father and, and there's other family members as well. And it's a very difficult, hard story, but, um, <clears throat> you know, anytime we go and explore a story as dark as that, and as challenging as that, um, we do try and find, <clears throat> excuse me, we do try and find purpose in that, you know, we don't want to just take these difficult stories and, and, and exploit them for a TV show, um, you know, to, to pop a rating. It's not what we're about. So, you know, they really helped guide us, uh, you know, Jake and his family in terms of wanting to do it. They, they were all about, you know, if we do this, we want to do this in order to help other people who have gone through the same things and, or who are lost or don't know where to go or, you know, are suffering from certain things or shame or whatever, or addictions. Uh, can we, put this program together um, and sort of have some sort of inspirational message to it. And it was like, absolutely, that that gives us kind of a reason to really look back at these more challenging uh, memories and stories. When you're looking at a season three, I mean, like you said, season one, you kind of had to put yourself on the map. Season two, I'm sure you kind of had a general direction. With season three, did you just kind of go, okay, what are like, let's, let's, just take off all of the governors like if we could have any episodes let's just put it out there like what would they be or did you kind of like sit down and go okay well these are the 10 we really want like how far out did you storyboard and kind of go this is what we really want uh well after season two wrapped up and and vice got in touch with us about about doing another season we were we were um i mean we were just you know we were we was we're so grateful for that and but then it was like you know, they were going to saddle us with 14 episodes, <laughs> not our choice. That's a lot to do, especially in a year. It's a lot of, a lot of filmmaking to do. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so we were a little bit like kind of blindsided by that number and had to kind of figure out like how we, was this even achievable, you know, the, uh, at a number that large. 
So <clears throat> we definitely had some stories like Brian Pillman um, and several others that are this season we had kind of already like um, I think we also had um, Collision in Korea pretty well lined up, you know, to do. And, you know, so we had some some we had some stories that we were already like ready to go. But then we really had to, you know, hit the ground running in terms of researching and figuring out what we can achieve on our schedule. Um, and for us, the criteria is just pretty, I mean, it's not like exact, but for the most part, it's just like, you know, we want to find the best stories, the, you know, the ones that transcend wrestling. Like, you know, our show, the way we do our shows, we don't tell biography, you know, like we don't really get into like, you know, here's the... <laughs> this person was born here and then this happened and then this happened. It's all about kind of, a, it goes back to a thesis. And we also just want to really make it an emotional, dramatic ride. You know, we want people to be invested in these characters, even if they aren't fans. It's something we're very sensitive to. So it's just basically like, here's a bunch of story ideas and w which ones fit those, that criteria and can really, you know, can, can, can really sustain that hour and, and, and be, be an experience, you know, and, and, and those are the ones that kind of make the final cut. And, you know, there's been a lot over the years that, you know, we've wanted to do that don't fit that criteria and um, it, you know, yeah, or we'll just put it off to the side and say, okay, well maybe, maybe somewhere down the road we can figure out and crack a way to tell this story in a way that we haven't quite figured out yet. Now, how many of these are you working on at any given time? Once you like, <laughs> once you found out season three is happening and you're doing that, what, how many? Uh, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Just all uh, of them. How, yeah. That's got to be super dis difficult because your brain's yeah. in every different space. I mean, it's not, it's not all of them. It's probably like, it's probably like at a given time. Well, it's, it's tough to say in, in all aspects, it is kind of all of them in some ways, because if you really think about it, like you know, we're, we're probably like documentary wise, we're probably on the ground shooting um, anywhere between four and five at a time. And then when that's happening, <clears throat> maybe in the very beginning of the season, we're kind of really focused on like maybe half of them. And then, then about a couple months into the process, you're kind of starting to work on all of them because then those four or five are being edited, you know, and then the edit gets to a certain point and then you have to shoot the reenactments for those. And then those start to get finished and then you're researching the ones for the next time. So it is, it is, it is difficult. And that's why 14 kind of makes you go, Oh, you know, it's not like, you know, um, yeah. So it's not like you get to do one at a time or anything like that would be amazing. I mean, that would be a dream, but no, these are all kind of concurrent and thank God we have such a killer team. Um, you know, especially this season, we were able to bring on, more bodies uh great great talent this season to work with you know someone especially with the with the pandemic which makes it even more hard you know because <laughs> in a lot of different ways it it, <laughs> it made things more challenging obviously we had to be super super safe and have all of the all of the protocols in place and you know safety above anything but uh as far as like you know travel is concerned like we didn't fly anywhere for these interviews we drove everywhere so we actually did multiple round trip uh, trips in, in, you know, driving around an RV, you know, like roughing it, like, you know, in, in KOA campsites and making <laughs> it happen, you know? Um, and then also when we get to set to shoot the reenactments, that's just, you know, again, that's, that there's a whole new set of protocols in place that, you know, we weren't used to at all in order to do it. But the thing that was really important to us was like, we had to main, we, we, we wanted to be as safe as possible. We didn't want anyone in harm's way a hundred percent but we also didn't want to sacrifice the quality of the show in any way. Like we didn't want the show to change. We didn't want to do some weird remote interview version of the show or, you know, that just, we would have just waited or not mm. done it. So I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to, to figure that out and, and, to, and to do it still the way that we normally do it. But um, yeah, to answer your question, um, most, most of the time it's all of them. Like right now, like, like right now, like four episodes are, I mean, we're still actively working on the show too. So, um, that's, you know, um, so like, I think only four episodes are, are in, four out of the 14 are actually done oh, right wow. now as we're, as we're talking. Yeah. Please tell me you've got some type of like dark side of the dark side of the Winnebago where you like record <laughs> you guys going from city to city, town to town to talk <clears throat> to these people. We, 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 uh, had the idea. Well, we had that idea to do it. And then in practice, it was just like, we, there was just, we don't have, we didn't have, we didn't have the strength 
<laughs> we didn't have the strength. Like we're tired. This is too much. Just like, just like from, from, you know, shooting one day, driving 10 hours the next day, shooting, you know, and just, and yeah, just, and it was, it was just three of us um, on the road. So it was a scaled down version of our crew. Um, and it was just like, in, in the beginning, I transitioned out of it because I had to start working on the edits, mm -hmm. but it was me and two other guys, like our director of photography and, um, our, um, assistant cameraman, but that's short selling his role in a major way. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, yeah, it was just the three of us on the road, you know, put on probably 20,000 miles, you know, <laughs> and that cuts into so much of the time too, having to drive totally. versus hopping on a flight. You got to plan that out. Well, man. Oh, does it ever yeah for sure yeah <laughs> do you think the fact that you now have more episodes and more content to produce do you think that um in a way kind of benefits you because some of the stories when you have eight episodes like when you got into some of the stories you really maybe wanted to go deeper but now that you have 14 you're like you know what i want to go that way but i really don't have time to go that way so i just got to stay on this path and stick to this because i have so much other stuff that yeah. i need to get to I mean, you know, we have really super high standards for the whole show, you know, so <laughs> there are times where we've done or, you know, we've looked at doing episodes out of convenience, you know, I guess if you want to call it that in terms of like, you know, and sometimes it's worked like I remember when we did Road Warriors, like the way that last season that we did it was like, you know, we obviously wanted to tell a story. We're huge Road Warriors fans, but, you know, <clears throat> it was like, OK, the only way to do this is that we can't we have such a short amount of time to get this thing done that we have to literally bring everybody to one location. So we actually flew all of the people in that episode to Minnesota, you know, where they're all from anyway. So it was kind of thematically great. And then we just brought them all together and, and filmed the episode that way. Um, and, you know, so sometimes you have to do things like that in, 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 a, in a, when, when things like, you know, you're at the maximum crunch, um, you know, when you're at the time where just your, your, your schedule has no give anymore and you're just, you have to keep going and you can't lose a day or even a few hours. <laughs> you know, Yeah. I'm trying to remember of the two seasons, like, did you ever have any of the topics where things kind of changed in the middle of you recording? Like something happened in real life that changed what, like, I, like, a good example, it wasn't your show, but I feel like something happened with the Ric Flair 30 for 30 where they had to like amend the ending because something had happened in his actual real life. Like he might've gotten sick or something. So oh, if you had anything where, was, yeah. yeah. So if you had anything where yeah. something happened to kind of like even change the story that you're in the middle of, like anyone pass uh, away or anyone kind of. No, uh, no, uh, I, I don't think think so i don't think that that's that that's come up i mean mm -hmm. obviously sometimes uh well i guess the only time that that's act, i guess i take that back the one time that that's happened it was in season one when we were doing an episode about gino hernandez and um that was just a real journalistic exercise it's kind of like one ep one or two episodes a season you know you kind of walk into a an up you walk into a story completely in the dark you know where you just know like a wikipedia page worth of information about it and then you're just and then you know by the end of it you know you've you you've gone places you never thought you would and those are the most fun and interesting engaging ones to to make obviously because for the most part a lot of these stories have been chronicled a lot or as fans you've heard about them you know in some capacity like the brian pillman one for example is a story that if you read the book or you watch the shoot interviews you know you would know the the basics of but the Gino story, you know, about, you know, was a, you know, virtually, you know, very uh, not known, very obscure wrestler, you know, who died well before, you know, he reached any sort of real national level of fame, but his death was shrouded in all of this, um, you know, mystery and conspiracy. And, it, and, and for the first time, it's not just the wrestlers that, you know, believed in, in that conspiracy. It was his family believed he was murdered. Like he, you know, believed that he didn't know Dion, on drugs he actually was murdered and so that's what all we knew going into it and then we overturned these stones and we found you know and then it was kind of like at the very last minute we found we were able to like contact some of the guys who had run who were you know his drug dealer um colleagues back in the 80s who one you know spoke on the record and one spoke you know basically in, a, in an anonymous scrambled voice but we were able to get some real information to give the family some closure that they've never had and that was a time where i remember before, right before we finished the episode i actually flew back to 
um, the family and, you know, played them those recordings and got their reactions and, and um, because, you know, the ending was completely different, you know, than we'd ever, ever would have thought, you know, so that, that has happened actually. Got it. So it's interesting you bring that up, that episode up. I had posed uh, a post on Facebook just to see if anyone had any questions for you. And that was one of the episodes that someone brought up asking um, if you were happy with the way the episode uh, was done and if it was hard to gather all the information about him and his death. Yeah, I, I, I'm very happy with the episode. I think, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting, like when you watch it, and I think that it's a big part of our show is that, you know, we, we don't like to like kind of spell everything out, you know, we don't like to leave you like, we always like to leave viewers kind of at a crossroads if we can, like, we like to show how complicated these things are, you know, and I think for some people when they watch that episode, they go, Oh, no, he was murdered for sure. You know, you can't trust those guys, you know, and then other people say no, I mean, you know, he obviously OD'd. He wasn't murdered. That's a conspiracy, you know? So I, I kind of like how there's that disparity in that. And I like how people just take different sides with that. I think that's really fun. Um, but for me, it was a really, uh, it was a wild experience. I think it was one of the the most emotional experiences I had in season one making, uh, making the show because when, you know, uh, the, there was a moment where we were we obtained crime scene photos that had never really seen you know uh been uh uh seen by the family and like to be able to ha like you know as a wrestling fan you know growing up as just a fan like possessing such a thing that's so heavy that's so significant to this family and um and all those things and also just yeah trying to provide some closure for them you know but yeah i mean it was a, it was a heavy experience definitely than just making a, a wrestling show you know <laughs> so uh yeah, so th that one is one of my more fond personal favorite episodes, I think. It was, uh, I want to say it was in the last month or two. One of the fascinating episodes was the, uh, the Bruiser Brody one. And I feel like it was in the last month or two that like Michael Hayes actually put on Twitter. Does anyone else find it crazy that Bruiser, Bur Bruiser Brody was murdered and people just literally got away with it? Like that could never happen here. And because he was in Mexico, he, or Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico yeah. uh, gets murdered in a locker room and there's so many shady things going on that people just literally got away with it. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, it, you know, that, that's, that's the story that, that started it all for us. You know, that's what, you know, captivated us into wanting to make a show like this in the first place, because the main theme, you know, that we're interested in exploring is this idea when, the kayfabe world or the, the the closed off world of wrestling kind of spills out into real life and um there's kind of this this blurred lines aspect between reality and fiction and um and that 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 this the bruiser brody story is kind of the highest uh, stakes version of that because you know back in the 80s when you know in a kayfabe locker room like that when you have heels and baby faces in two different locker rooms and, and they're taking it that seriously um, I think there there was a whole culture of uh, of that where it's like you see something like that go down, you don't say anything. It's not my problem because in wrestling, you know, you're your own CEO. You're the CEO of your own. You're 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 a lone ranger. They're like you know, you don't have allegiance to hardly anybody. You know, especially back in those territory days. And I, I think that that's kind of just shows that culture that like someone could be so callous as to see that happen and to not really say anything or do anything. You know, but Tony Atlas having the heart that he had, you know, he tried, he tried to do what he could, you know, but at the end of the day, um, you know, the skilled attorneys, you know, the, uh, the skilled defense attorneys, you know, were, were showing Bruiser Brody and painting him in a light that was look at this vicious heel wrestler. And then of course they got the, you know, self-defense conviction. And yeah, I, I, I think like it, it, it is crazy. If that were to happen today, I mean, it would be frontline, news everywhere just just because of the way information travels now but yeah i mean it wasn't really covered in the states really mm -hmm. that was crazy and then the one moment that always sticks out to me and i'd like to get your opinion because you were there when it happened uh the jimmy snooka interview when for years snooka said it was home it was only him and his girlfriend riding to the city and then in the middle of the interview i believe it was sam fatu who was like no i was in the car with them Oh yeah. And no one had ever known that information. And even the police chief was like, no, that's not true. But he was like, no, I rode with them all the way to the thing. I was there. That was one thing that was really, that, that was really weird to me because, um, I, 
it's one of those things where you know wrestlers ne- ne- aren't necessarily the most reliable witnesses sometimes <laughs> you know i mean there there is a lot of exaggeration and and um <laughs> there's a lot of you know there's a lot of that you know rick flair says he was there when bruiser brody was stabbed and you know everybody knows that he wasn't there you know mm-hmm. so like that that happens where i think wrestlers over time as stories grow and they become you know told and passed around and i mean jimmy snooka thing and that was 35 years ago plus you know mm-hmm. and and um you know it's more than that actually but you know what i'm saying it's like i think i think there is something where it's like inserting yourself in those memories too that could be what was happening there but i'm not really sure and i do remember before i put that in there that i did go back to the transcripts of his interview and made sure that that's what he meant because i didn't want to catch him in like a moment where it's like gotcha you know kind of thing Mm -hmm. you know and it was like and and that's why i remember like in the interview like are you sure Mm -hmm. you were in that car because if you're in that car that means there's a lot of a lot of different things changes everything like i remember watching and i kind of almost jumped out of my chair i was like what did he say like (laughs) yeah Yeah. (laughs) you just admitted you were there and jimmy stoker has said for years that it was only the two of them yeah and 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 yeah that th- there's been other things that have come to light you know uh since the airing of that episode it's actually kind of one of the episodes that um is really tough for people like people who are fans of jimmy snooka it's a really tough one um and uh, it's kind of the one i think we've gotten the most heat for in a lot of ways because you know a lot of people don't you know it's it's, it's a complicated one you know mm-hmm. but but you look at all the information that's been verified in the documentation and especially the newspaper reports at the time that covered the first domestic violence story. It's just, you know, I mean, it's to me, that's, I don't know, pretty convincing, pretty convincing, you know, but people don't want to believe, you know, so. Right. Exactly. So um, before we wrap it up, I'm going to kind of put you on the spot because I know you don't have all the episodes finished yet, but I'm going to ask you this question because I feel like you probably have it in your head how they're going to go. You just haven't really edited them together and kind of, Mm -hmm. you know, the final product. So here's what I'm going to ask you. So it's based on the fact that a good friend of mine who is a huge wrestling fan, his wife is addicted to the show and she knows nothing. (laughs) She she knows nothing about wrestling. Those are my favorite people. Those are my favorite viewers because those are really the viewers that we're making the show for. Exactly. Yes. I mean, like for people like me, yes, I love wrestling and I know most of the right. stories and it's still fascinating to me, but you're trying to get the people who are into those real drama stories. Like, like, uh, uh, Steph, what did I call it before we got on here? It's like, yeah, uh, the E true Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's the E true Hollywood story for wrestling. So here's my question. If someone out there is really into wrestling and they're trying to hook their significant other into watching this, mm-hmm. this season, which episode would you say to them, show them this episode and that should hook them? Oh, um, that's a good one. Um, well, I mean, you know, I, I think that the, I think, I think that the Brian Pillman one, because it is such a, uh, it is such a sweeping story. I mean, the second piece, the second half of it is, you know, um, it, 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 it is a story that doesn't just sort of end with, you know, when spoiler alert, you know, when Brian dies, mm-hmm. um, there is a whole, you know, f- f- you know, familial saga that, you know, plays on even after that, which I think is going to make the most impact uh, this Thursday when, when, when people finally get a chance to see it. But man, there's a lot. There's a lot. It's hard to pick just like one. Um, I'm worried about how the um, non wrestling fan audiences are going to uh, interpret the episode on the following week, which will be about Nick Gage and the deathmatch wrestling world, um, because that is one of the most anxiety inducing <laughs> episodes that we've ever made, because I'm not a big deathmatch wrestling fan. And uh, uh, it's just it's just I, I have a hard thing with like, you know, being cut and you know and, and with you know light tubes and things like that it's just like ugh, it makes my skin crawl mm-hmm. but that <laughs> episode is yeah that episode is really intense right super super so and so intense in the way that like there's definitely certain times of the day we're not allowed to show it it's one of the only episodes that our standards and practices people were like uh-uh when they first saw like the first cut of it because it was like a snuff film basically <laughs> that's what it felt like yeah um 
So that one I'm worried about for those people <laughs> out mm. there. But it is still an amazing story. I mean, the story is just wild. It's, you know, it's one of the wilder stories we've done. Um, but man, you know, it's like, uh, I think, I think the Smith family episode is going to be intriguing to a lot of people. It's a hard story. Um, it's not an easy one, especially if you've gone through anything similar, it's going to be tough. Um, but, uh, I think it's an important one. Um, I'm just sort of thinking about all the things that we have, cause there's so many to keep them all straight. Um, <laughs> but when you're Dynamite working on kid, that many at one time, <laughs> You totally. We're working brain. on all of them. Yeah, they all just kind of bleed together. Uh, no, the uh, Dynamite Kid story, I think, is uh, definitely going to be another one of those that, you know, is going to provoke a lot of conversation afterwards mm -hmm. in terms of a wrestler's legacy. But, you know, undeniable, probably the probably the best wrestler that has ever been in the ring is him. You know, and just looking at that and 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 just the family story stuff on that is just some of the some of the more rid uh, riveting uh, stuff that we have. Um, but yeah, there's, there's so many, there really is like, you know, the Johnny canine bruiser bedlam story we have that's coming up in the back half of the, of the, uh, of the, uh, of the third season, which is about a jobber wrestler, just this kind of guy who didn't make much of an impact in the wrestling national landscape, but led this secret life of being the president of a Canadian biker gang and being, you know, he's, he's, you know, implicated in bombing a police station and a double homicide, you know, so there's just, there's wacky stories. There, there's, there's, there's something for everybody this season. This is definitely the, I think the most, in terms of the types of different stories, the most diverse type of stories that we have, like the, every episode has its own tone and universe. And I think that's what I'm really excited about for the whole season. I'm so goddamn excited now. Like I was excited before <laughs> and now like, I'm like, I'm giddy. I'm ready for it. Yeah, really? So, yeah, so I like I used all my face. I was just like, "What?" <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. um, maybe when it's all said and done, you have them all done, we can have you back on and we can talk about which one was actually your favorite. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, you know, like I said, four of them are like done, done. The next four are about to be like done, mm. uh, but the back, the back six of uh, the back six episodes are still very much um, in the editing process and the the puzzle piece, you know, trying to solve the storytelling of it. But I mean, I'm, I mean, all the interviews are, this year have been fantastic. Um, you know, we have a lot of amazing people that we talk to. This is definitely our biggest like star studded, you know, season um, for in terms of big names for in the wrestling world. And um, yeah, it's just, I, I am just really excited to see when this, when this is all like looking back and be like, Oh my God, I can't believe we made 30 episodes of the show. <laughs> it's crazy. I'm excited. Steph, you're excited. I'm super excited. Absolutely. We can't wait. And uh, Evan, uh, we're super excited for the season. Oh, and awesome. Thank you guys so much. Thanks so much, man. Yeah.